Lessons 1 and 2 of The Power of Concentration This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Andrea Fiore, December 29, 2007 The Power of Concentration by Theron Q. Dumont Lesson 1. Concentration Finds the Way Everyone has two natures. One wants us to advance, and the other wants to pull us back. The one that we cultivate and concentrate on decides what we are at the end. Both natures are trying to gain control. The will alone decides the issue. A man by one supreme effort of the will may change his whole career and almost accomplish miracles. You may be that man. You can be, if you will to be, for will can find a way or make one. I could easily fill a book of cases where men plodding along in a matter-of-fact way were all at once aroused, and as if awakening from a slumber, they developed the possibilities within them, and from that time on were different persons. You alone can decide when the turning point will come. It is a matter of choice whether we allow our diviner self to control us, or whether we will be controlled by the brute within us. No man has to do anything he does not want to do. He is therefore the director of his life if he wills to be. What we are to do is the result of our training. We are like putty and can be completely controlled by our willpower. Habit is a matter of acquirement. You hear people say, he comes by this or that naturally, a chip off the old block, meaning that he is the only one doing what his parents did. This is quite often the case, but there is no reason for it, for a person can break a habit just the moment he masters the I will. A man may have been a good-for-nothing all his life up to this very minute, but from this time on he begins to amount to something. Even old men have suddenly changed and accomplished wonders. I lost my opportunity, says one. That may be true, but by sheer force of will we can find a way to bring us another opportunity. There is no truth in the saying that opportunity knocks at our door but once in a lifetime. The fact is, opportunity never seeks us. We must seek it. What usually turns out to be one man's opportunity was another man's loss. In this day, one man's brain is matched against another's. It is often the quickness of brain action that determines the result. One man thinks, I will do it, but while he procrastinates, the other goes ahead and does the work. They both have the same opportunity. The one will complain of his lost chance, but it should teach him a lesson, and it will, if he is seeking the path that leads to success. Many persons read good books, but they say they do not get much good out of them. They do not realize that all any book or any lesson course can do is to awaken them to their possibilities, to stimulate them to use their willpower. You may teach a person from now until doomsday, but that person will only know what he learns himself. You can lead him to the fountain, but you can't make him drink. One of the most beneficial practices I know of is that of looking for the good in every one and everything, for there is good in all things. We encourage a person by seeing his good qualities, and we also help ourselves by looking for them. We gain their good wishes, a most valuable asset sometimes. We get back what we give out. The time comes when most all of us need encouragement, need buoying up. So form the habit of encouraging others, and you will find it a wonderful tonic for both those encouraged and yourself, for you will get back encouraging and uplifting thoughts. Life furnishes us the opportunity to improve, but whether we do it or not depends upon how near we live up to what is expected of us. The first of each month a person should sit down and examine the progress he has made. If he has not come up to expectations, he should discover the reason. 
and by extra exertion measure up to what is demanded next time. Every time that we fall behind what we plan to do, we lose just so much, for that time is gone forever. We may find a reason for doing it, but most excuses are poor substitutes for action. Most things are possible. Ours may be a hard task, but the harder the task, the greater the reward. It is the difficult things that really develop us. Anything that requires only a small effort utilizes very few of our faculties and yields a scanty harvest of achievement. So do not shrink from a hard task, for to accomplish one of these will often bring us more good than a dozen lesser triumphs. I know that every man that is willing to pay the price can be a success. The price is not in money, but in effort. The first essential quality for success is the desire to do, to be something. The next thing is to learn how to do it, the next to carry it into execution. The man that is the best able to accomplish anything is the one with a broad mind, the man that has acquired knowledge that may, it is true, be foreign to this particular case, but is nevertheless of some value in all cases. So the man that wants to be successful must be liberal. He must acquire all the knowledge that he can. He must be well posted not only in one branch of his business, but in every part of it. Such a man achieves success. The secret of success is to try always to improve yourself no matter where you are or what your position. Learn all you can. Don't see how little you can do, but how much you can do. Such a man will always be in demand, for he establishes the reputation of being a hustler. There is always room for him because progressive firms never let a hustler leave their employment if they can help it. The man that reaches the top is the gritty, plucky, hard worker and never the timid, uncertain, slow worker. An untried man is seldom put in a position of responsibility and power. The man selected is one that has done something, achieved results in some line, or taken the lead in his department. He is placed there because of his reputation of putting vigor and virility into his efforts, and because he has previously shown that he has pluck and determination. The man that is chosen at the crucial time is not usually a genius. He does not possess any more talent than others, but he has learned that results can only be produced by untiring, concentrated effort. That miracles in business do not just happen. He knows that the only way they will happen is by sticking to a proposition and seeing it through. That is the only secret of why some succeed and others fail. The successful man gets used to seeing things accomplished and always feels sure of success. The man that is a failure gets used to seeing failure, expects it, and attracts it to him. It is my opinion that with the right kind of training, every man could be a success. It is really a shame that so many men and women, rich in ability and talent, are allowed to go to waste, so to speak. Some day I hope to see a millionaire philanthropist start a school for the training of failures. I'm sure he could not put his money to a better use. In a year's time, the science of practical psychology could do wonders for him. He could have agencies on the lookout for men that had lost their grip on themselves, that had through indisposition weakened their will, that through some sorrow or misfortune had become discouraged. At first, all they need is a little help to get them back on their feet, but usually they get a knock downwards instead. The result is that their latent powers never develop, and both they and the world are the losers. I trust that in the near future, someone will heed the opportunity of using some of his millions in arousing men that have begun to falter. All they need to be shown is that there is within them an omnipotent source that is ready to aid them, providing they will make use of it. Their minds only have to be turned from despair to hope to make them regain their hold. When a man loses his grip today, 
he must win his redemption by his own will. He will get little encouragement or advice of an inspiring nature. He must usually regain the right road alone. He must stop dissipating his energies and turn his attention to building a useful career. Today we must conquer our weakening tendencies alone. Don't expect anyone to help you. Just take one big brace, make firm resolutions, and resolve to conquer your weaknesses and vices. Really, no one can do this for you. They can encourage you. That is all. I can think of nothing but lack of health that should interfere with one becoming successful. There is no other handicap that you should not be able to overcome. To overcome a handicap, all that is necessary to do is to use more determination and grit and will. The man with grit and will may be poor today and wealthy in a few years. Will power is a better asset than money. Will will carry you over chasms of failure if you but give it the chance. The men that have risen to the highest positions have usually had to gain their victories against big odds. Think of the hardships many of our inventors have gone through before they became a success. Usually they have been very much misunderstood by relatives and friends. Very often they did not have the bare necessities of life. Yet by sheer determination and resolute courage, they managed to exist somehow until they perfected their inventions, which afterwards greatly helped in bettering the condition of others. Everyone really wants to do something, but there are very few that will put forth the needed effort to make the necessary sacrifice to secure it. There is only one way to accomplish anything, and that is to go ahead and do it. A man may accomplish almost anything today if he just sets his heart on doing it and lets nothing interfere with his progress. Obstacles are quickly overcome by the man that sets out to accomplish his heart's desire. The bigger the man, the smaller the obstacle appears. The smaller the man, the greater the obstacle appears. Always look at the advantage you gain by overcoming obstacles, and it will give you the needed courage for their conquest. Do not expect that you will always have easy sailing. Parts of your journey are likely to be rough. Don't let the rough places put you out of commission. Keep on with the journey. Just the way you weather the storm shows what material you are made of. Never sit down and complain of the rough places, but think how nice the pleasant stretches were. View with delight the smooth plains that are in front of you. Do not let a setback stop you. Think of it as a mere incident that has to be overcome before you can reach your goal. Lesson 2. The Self-Mastery. Self-Direction Power of Concentration. Man from a psychological standpoint of development is not what he should be. He does not possess the self-mastery, the self-directing power of concentration that is his by right. He has not trained himself in a way to promote his self-mastery. Every balanced mind possesses the faculties whose chief duties are to engineer, direct, and concentrate the operations of the mind, both in a mental and physical sense. Man must learn to control not only his mind, but his bodily movements. When the controlling faculties, autonomic, are in an untrained condition, the impulses, passions, emotions, thoughts, actions, and habits of the person suffer from lack of regulation, and the procedure of mental concentration is not good, not because the mind is necessarily weak in the autonomic department of the faculties, but because the mind is not properly trained. When the self-regulating faculties are not developed, the impulses, appetites, emotions, and passions have full swing to do as they please, and the mind becomes impulsive, restless, emotional, and irregular in its action. This is what makes mental concentration poor. When the self-guiding faculties are weak in development, the person always lacks the power of mental concentration. Therefore, you cannot learn to concentrate 
until you develop those very powers that qualify you to be able to concentrate. So if you cannot concentrate, one of the following is the cause. 1. Deficiency of the motor centers. 2. An impulsive and emotional mind. 3. An untrained mind. The last fault can soon be removed by systematic practice. It is the easiest to correct. The impulsive and emotional state of mind can best be corrected by restraining anger, passion and excitement, hatred, strong impulses, intense emotions, fretfulness, etc. It is impossible to concentrate when you are in any of these excited states. These can be naturally decreased by avoiding such food and drinks as have nerve weakening or stimulating influences, or a tendency to stir up the passions, the impulses, and the emotions. It is a very good practice to watch and associate with those persons that are steady, calm, controlled, and conservative. Correcting the deficiency of the motor centers is harder because as the person's brain is undeveloped, he lacks willpower. To cure this takes some time. Persons so afflicted may benefit by reading and studying my course, The Mastermind, to be published by Advanced Thought Publishing Corporation, Chicago, Illinois. Many have the idea that when they get into a negative state, they are concentrating, but this is not so. They may be meditating, though not concentrating. Those that are in a negative state a good deal of the time cannot, as a rule, concentrate very well. They develop instead abstraction of the mind, or absence of mind. Their power of concentration becomes weaker, and they find it difficult to concentrate on anything. They very often injure the brain if they keep up this state. To be able to concentrate, you must possess strength of mind. The person that is feeble-minded cannot concentrate his mind, because of lack of will. The mind that cannot center itself on a special subject or thought is weak. Also the mind that cannot draw itself from a subject or thought is weak. But the person that can center his mind on any problem, no matter what it is, and remove any unharmonious impressions, has strength of mind. Concentration, first, last, and all of the time, means strength of mind. Through concentration, a person is able to collect and hold his mental and physical energies at work. A concentrated mind pays attention to thoughts, words, acts, and plans. The person who allows his mind to roam at will will never accomplish a great deal in the world. He wastes his energies. If you work, think, talk, and act aimlessly, and allow your brain to wander from your subject to foreign fields, you will not be able to concentrate. You concentrate the moment when you say, I want to, I can, I will. Some mistakes some people make. If you waste your time reading sensational stories or worthless newspaper items, you excite the impulsive and the emotional faculties, and this means you are weakening your power of concentration. You will not be a free engineer able to pilot yourself to success. Concentration of the mind can only be developed by watching yourself closely. All kinds of development commence with close attention. You should regulate your every thought and feeling. When you commence to watch yourself and your own acts and also the acts of other people, you use the faculties of autonomy, and as you continue to do so, you improve your faculties, until in time you can engineer your every thought, wish, and plan. To be able to focalize the mind on the object at hand in a conscious manner leads to concentration. Only the trained mind can focalize. To hold a thought before it until all the faculties shall have had the time to consider that thought is concentration. The person that cannot direct his thoughts, wishes, plans, resolutions, and studies cannot possibly succeed to the fullest extent. The person that is impulsive one moment 
and calm the next, has not the proper control over himself. He is not a master of his mind, nor of his thoughts, feelings, and wishes. Such a person cannot be a success. When he becomes irritated, he irritates others, and spoils all chances of any concern doing their best. But the person that can direct his energies, and hold them at work, in a concentrated manner, controls his every work and act, and thereby gains the power to control others. He can make his every move serve a useful end, and every thought a noble purpose. In this day, the man that gets excited and irritable should be looked upon as an undesirable person. The person of good breeding now speaks with slowness and deliberation. He is cultivating more and more of a reposeful attitude. He is consciously attentive and holds his mind to one thing at a time. He shuts out everything else. When you are talking to anyone, give him your sole and undivided attention. Do not let your attention wander or be diverted. Give no heed to anything else, but make your will and intellect act in unison. Start out in the morning and see how self-poised you can remain all day. At times take an inventory of your actions during the day and see if you have kept your determination. If not, see that you do tomorrow. The more self-poised you are, the better will your concentration be. Never be in too much of a hurry. And remember, the more you improve your concentration, the greater are your possibilities. Concentration means success, because you are better able to govern yourself and centralize your mind. You become more in earnest in what you do, and this almost invariably improves your chances for success. When you are talking to a person, have your own plans in mind. Concentrate your strength upon the purpose you are talking about. Watch his every move, but keep your own plans before you. Unless you do, you will waste your energy and not accomplish as much as you should. I want you to watch the next person you see that has the reputation of being a strong character, a man of force. Watch and see what a perfect control he has over his body. Then I want you to watch just an ordinary person. Notice how he moves his eyes, arms, fingers. Notice the useless expenditure of energy. These movements all break down the vital cells and lessen the person's power in vital and nerve directions. It is just as important for you to conserve your nerve forces as it is the vital forces. As an example, we see an engine going along the track very smoothly. Someone opens all the valves and the train stops. It is the same with you. If you want to use your full amount of steam, you must close your valves and direct your power of generating mental steam toward one end. Center your mind on one purpose, one plan, one transaction. There is nothing that uses up nerve force so quickly as excitement. This is why an irritable person is never magnetic. He is never admired or loved. He does not develop those finer qualities that a real gentleman possesses. Anger, sarcasm, and excitement weaken a person in this direction. The person that allows himself to get excited will become nervous in time because he uses up his nerve forces and his vital energies. The person that cannot control himself and keep from becoming excited cannot concentrate. When the mind can properly concentrate, all the energy of every microscopic cell is directed into one channel and then there is a powerful personal influence generated. Everyone possesses many millions of little trembling cells, and each one of these has a center where life and energy are stored up and generated. If this energy is not wasted, but conserved and controlled, this person is influential. But when it is the opposite, he is not influential or successful. Just as it is impossible for a steam engine to run with all its valves open, so it is impossible for you to waste your energy and run at your top speed. Each neuron in the gray layers of the brain is a psychic center of thought and action. 
each one is pulsating an intelligent force of some kind. And when this force, your thoughts and motions, are kept in check by a conservative, systematic, and concentrated mind, the result will be magnetism, vitality, and health. The muscles, bones, ligaments, feet, hands and nerves, etc., are agents for carrying out the mandates of the mind. The sole purpose of the volitional faculties is to move the physical mechanism as the energy travels along the wires of nerves and muscles. Just for that reason, if you throw a voluntary control over these messages, impulses, thoughts, emotions, physical movements, and over these physical instruments, you develop your faculties of self-mastery, and to the extent you succeed here, in proportion, will you develop the power of concentration. Any exercise or work that excites the mind, stimulates the senses, calls the emotions and appetites into action, confuses, terrifies, or emotionalizes, weakens the power of concentration. This is why all kind of excitement is bad. This is the reason why persons who drink strong drinks, who allow themselves to get into fits of temper, who fight, who eat stimulating food, who sing and dance and thus develop their emotions, who are sudden, vehement, and emotional, lack the power to concentrate. But those whose actions are slower and directed by their intelligence develop concentration. Sometimes dogmatic, willful, excitable persons can concentrate, but it is spasmodic, erratic concentration, instead of controlled and uniform concentration. Their energy works by spells. Sometimes they have plenty, other times very little. It is easily excited, easily wasted. The best way to understand it is to compare it with the discharge of a gun. If the gun goes off when you want it to, it accomplishes the purpose. But if it goes off before you are ready for it, you will not only waste ammunition, but it is also likely to do some damage. That is just what most persons do. They allow their energy to explode, thus not only wasting it, but endangering others. They waste their power, their magnetism, and so injure their chance of success. Such persons are never well liked, and never will be, until they gain control over themselves. It will be necessary for them to practice many different kinds of concentration exercises, and to keep them up for some time. They must completely overcome their sudden erratic thoughts, and regulate their emotions and movements. They must from morning to night train the mind to be steady and direct, and keep the energies at work. The lower area of the brain is the storehouse of the energy. Most all persons have the dynamic energy they need if they would concentrate on it. They have the machine, but they must also have the engineer, or they will not go very far. The engineer is the self-regulating, directing power. The person that does not develop his engineering qualities will not accomplish much in life. The good engineer controls his every act. All work assists in development. By what you do, you either advance or degenerate. This is a good idea to keep always in mind. When you are uncertain whether you should do something or not, just think whether by doing it you will grow or deteriorate, and act accordingly. I am a firm believer in work when you work, and play when you play. When you give yourself up to pleasure, you can develop concentration by thinking of nothing else but pleasure. When your mind dwells on love, think of nothing but this, and you will find you can develop a more intense love than you ever had before. When you concentrate your mind on the you, or real self, and its wonderful possibilities, you develop concentration and a higher opinion of yourself. By doing this systematically, you develop much power, because you cannot be systematic without concentrating on what you are doing. When you walk out into the country and inhale the fresh air, studying vegetation, trees, etc., you are concentrating. When you see that you are at your place of business at a certain time each morning, 
you are developing steadiness of habit and becoming systematic. If you form the habit of being on time one morning, a little late the next, and still later the following one, you are not developing concentration. But whenever you fix your mind on a certain thought and hold your mind on it at successive intervals, you develop concentration. If you hold your mind on some chosen object, you centralize your attention, just like the lens of the camera centralizes on a certain landscape. Therefore, always hold your mind on what you are doing, no matter what it is. Keep a careful watch over yourself, for unless you do, your improvement will be very slow. Practice inhaling long, deep breaths, not simply for the improvement of health, although that is no small matter, but also for the purpose of developing more power, more love, more life. All work assists in development. You may think it foolish to try to develop concentration by taking muscular exercises, but you must not forget that the mind is associated with muscle and nerve. When you steady your nerves and muscles, you steady your mind, but let your nerves get out of order and your mind will become erratic, and you will not possess the power of direction, which, in other words, is concentration. Therefore you understand how important exercises that steady the nerves and muscles are in developing concentration. Everyone is continually receiving impulses that must be directed and controlled if one is to lead a successful life. That is the reason why a person must control the movements of his eyes, feet, fingers, etc. This is another reason why it is important to control his breathing. The slow, deep, prolonged exhalations are of wonderful value. They steady the circulation, the heart action, muscles and nerves of the mind. If the heart flutters, the circulation is not regular. And when the lung action is uneven, the mind becomes unsteady and not fit for concentration. This is why controlled breathing is very important as a foundation for physical health. You must not only concentrate your mind, but also the action of the eyes, ears, and fingers. Each of these contain miniature minds that are controlled by the master engineer. You will develop much quicker if you thoroughly realize this. If you have ever associated with big men or read their biographies, you will find that they usually let the others do the talking. It is much easier to talk than it is to listen. There is no better exercise for concentration than to pay close attention when someone is talking. Besides learning from what they have to say, you may develop both mental and physical concentration. When you shake hands with someone, just think of your hand as containing hundreds of individual minds, each having an intelligence of its own. When you put this feeling into your handshake, it shows personality. When you shake hands in a listless way, it denotes timidity, lack of force, and power of personality. When the hand grip is very weak and stiff, the person has little love in his nature, no passion and no magnetism. When the handshake is just the opposite, you will find that the nature is also. The loveless person is non-magnetic, and he shows that he is by his non-magnetic handshake. When two developed souls shake hands, their clasps are never light. There is a thrill that goes through both when the two currents meet. Love arouses the opposite currents of the positive and negative natures. When there is no love, life loses its charm. The hand quickly shows when love is being aroused. This is why you should study the art of handshaking and develop your social affections. A person that loves his kind reflects love, but a person that hates reflects hate. The person with a bad nature, a hateful disposition, evil thoughts and feeling, is erratic, freakish, and fitful. When you allow yourself to become irritable, watch how you breathe and you will learn a valuable lesson. Watch how you breathe when you are happy. Watch your breathing when you harbor hate. Watch how you breathe when you feel in love with the whole world and noble emotions thrill you.
when filled with good thoughts you breathe a plentiful supply of oxygen into your lungs and love fills your soul love develops a person physically mentally and socially breathe deeply when you are happy and you will gain life and strength you will steady your mind and you will develop your power of concentration and become magnetic and powerful if you want to get more out of life you must think more of love unless you have real affection for something you have no sentiment no sweetness no magnetism so arouse your love affections by your will and enter into a fuller life the hand of love always magnetizes but it must be steady and controlled love can be concentrated in your handshake and this is one of the best ways to influence another the next time you feel yourself becoming irritable use your will and be patient this is a very good exercise in self-control it will help you to keep patient if you will breathe slowly and deeply if you find you are commencing to speak fast just control yourself and speak slowly and clearly keep from either raising or lowering your voice and concentrate on the fact that you are determined to keep your poise and you will improve your power of concentration when you meet people of some consequence assume a reposeful attitude before them do this at all times watch both them and yourself static exercises develop the motor faculties and increase the power of concentration if you feel yourself getting irritable nervous or weak stand squarely on your feet with your chest up and inhale deeply and you will see that your irritability will disappear and a silent calm will pass over you if you are in the habit of associating with nervous irritable people quit it until you grow strong in the power of concentration because irritable angry fretful dogmatic and disagreeable people will weaken what powers of resistance you have any exercises that give you better control of the ears fingers eyes feet help you to steady your mind when your eye is steady your mind is steady one of the best ways to study a person is to watch his physical movements for when we study his actions we are studying his mind because actions are the expressions of the mind as the mind is so is the action if it is uneasy restless erratic unsteady its actions are the same when it is composed the mind is composed concentration means control of the mind and body you cannot secure control over one without the other many people who seem to lack ambition have sluggish minds they are steady patient and seemingly have good control but this does not say they are able to concentrate these people are indolent inactive slow and listless because they lack energy they do not lose control because they have little force to control they have no temper and it therefore cannot disturb them their actions are steady because they possess little energy the natural person is internally strong energetic and forceful but his energy force and strength thoughts and physical movements are well under his control if a person does not have energy both mental and physical he must develop it if he has energy which he cannot direct and hold to a point he must learn to do so a man may be very capable but unless he wills to control his abilities they will not do him any good we hear so much talk about the benefit of physical culture but the real benefit of this is really lost sight of there is nothing that holds the faculties at work in a sustained and continuous manner as static exercises do for as stated before when you learn to control the body you are gaining control over the mind end of lesson two